Hello everyone, this is Olivia. In this lecture, um, I will go over similarity and K nearest neighbor, and these are concepts that uh, you will apply uh, in assignment six. Um, the topics today uh, is first to talk about the potential uses of similarity, and you'll find there is a right wide range, and that is why for a lot of data scientists, similarity is um, one of our favorite uh, metrics or topic. And so um, we'll talk about how to measure similarity using distance functions in uh, with some examples. Um, the focus will be on how to use similarity to make um, predictions amongst different tasks, but mainly in this class, in this lecture, we only focus on super, uh, use of uh, k-nearest neighbor, which is also um, called KNM for supervised learning. So um, we'll talk about uh, nearest neighbors, the use of them for predictions, and how um, and as part of the predictions, how to estimate target values using examples. What is unique about KNN and um, some of the parameter selections, such as how many nearest neighbors, that is what K stands for, and some other factors. Um, lastly, just comment on um, a couple of commonly known issues with KNN that we should uh, watch out for. And lastly, uh, I will just talk about um, the KNM function that you will use in R for your assignment, which is different from what is used in Chapter 3 of the book. And uh, I, um, Yuan Yuan has already recorded tutorial on sample code, uh, code uh, for KNM uh, based on um, uh, using R Weka. And I want to explain a little bit uh, why we are using that this semester. The main reference for this uh, uh, lecture, the best one is um, concepts. Many are well covered in chapter six of Data Science for Business. Even though very similarly, um, chapter three also covers these concepts. But um, I think if you only go to chapter six, that will be sufficient. Um, the sample code in chapter three is also posted in um, our canvas uh, for your reference. We will not use it and we will not go over um, uh, the sample code from chapter three. Um, the uh, sample code posted uh, based on chapter three has also been in, um, uh, enhanced for more uh, prediction uh, performance evaluation. Okay, so um, from uh, there are a number of tasks that oftentimes businesses may be interested in or in or different kind of applications. Uh, one is just finding things that are similar and that will become a foundation for other tasks. But the uh, this task itself can also uh, answer some business questions such as um, which um, companies or which business uh, customers are similar to IBM's current best business customers, or which pages are most similar to this particular web page that um, I am looking at, so I want to find some others. And which books are most similar to the current uh, book based on digital content. So there are so many um, applications are built on answers to these questions. Some examples are the following task, for example, once you can find what is similar, then we can make um, classification or numeric uh, prediction estimations um, based on the classes or the target variable values of uh, similar um, uh, objects or similar customers. Uh, those similar objects or customers are essentially the k nearest neighbors. Um, the next task is um, also one that we will look at, uh, not today, but next time, uh, based on similarity, is that knowing uh, which items are similar will group uh, similar ones into uh, single clusters and dissimilar ones into separate 
on clusters. That's the task called clustering. And um, what is what probably has many similarity uh, and k-nearest neighbors uh, most famous is the uh, popularity of uh, recommenders that tend to rec uh, recommend uh, movies or products that are similar to what a customer already likes or um, what uh, or products that other customers uh, similar to this one uh, may like or um, products other similar customers like. Uh, these are widely used by um, a lot of e-commerce um, websites, Netflix and Amazon, but also for other um, products or uh, application domains, including uh, dating in uh, websites, includes including um, uh, matching uh, jobs with uh, uh, applicants. So um, this is a uh, um, this has a lot of monetize, uh, monetization potential. Uh, the last is um, one that has been around for a long time, and uh, it is an, a methodology also based on similarity, uh, which we will not get into called case-based reasoning. Uh, it, uh, cases are focused on similar cases, and uh, this really has um, been used and uh, uh, been appropriate for uh, number of domains, but in healthcare or in legal area, uh, the trainings of doctors and lawyers have already emphasized on finding past legal cases, for example, that are similar to uh, one that's uh, being learned or once needs a uh, new one that needs to be handled. Same thing with uh, doctors training. Uh, in medical training or residency, there's a lot of focus on finding uh, and looking at uh, past patient cases and, and to learn from those cases uh, that how uh, we can handle new patient cases. So um, then since similarity is important, the first thing we learn is how to measure similarity. And this actually is, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, using distance function. In another word, is that when we want to compare two objects, uh, and in any data mining task, uh, the uh, objects or records are described using a number of attributes or variables. For example, uh, age, spending, gender, um, income, and etc. Um, and when uh, we want to compare the similarity between two objects or two customers, and then um, the uh, a quantitative approach is uh, use the values of these attributes to uh, gen uh, to calculate and treat uh, a distance functions. Treat them like different dimensions. Each of these attributes like a dimension in geometric multi-dimensional space and use their values as the uh, value on the um, each uh, space uh, in each space and then come up with um, a distance measure of uh, uh, of the dis uh, the distance between two objects if the distance is large then the two objects are less similar and if the distance is short um, then the similarity is high between uh, similarity between the two objects is high. So uh, distance function is something we have learned in uh, algebra uh, or geometry. Um, and just to review, um, there are a lot of different functions can be used to measure distance. Um, we will be focusing on uh, uh, and a lot of the uh, implementations out there either just assume one or two, or give you a number of them to choose. Uh, the distance functions have these uh, properties or the conditions that um, it must satisfy. It has to be non-negative, um, so there's no negative distance. But it can be zero. And specifically, zero is always um, true for the distance between um, the same objects, which means the distance from an object to itself is 
always zero. There's no other distance uh, unless uh, objects are exactly identical, can be zero. So um, distance symmetric, meaning distance from point A to B uh, is the same as the distance from B, point B to A. Um, and the uh, distance also meets the famous uh, relationship where uh, a tri in a triangle that the direct distance between any two points is uh, shorter than the indirect distance by going from A, for example, to another point C, then, uh, uh, then go from C to B. So that is a distance, uh, indirect distance by uh, passing through another um, uh, object C that is not on the segment between A and B. And so uh, most of the time, actually, distance functions will be calculated for us. But knowing um, um, what has been used out there can be helpful. And also uh, using the common distance functions, such as Manhattan, uh, Manhattan distance function, Euclidean uh, distance function, um, to understand some examples could be helpful. And uh, these two are also the most common ones, for example, especially the, uh, this Euclidean distance function has been the most popular one used. So uh, Manhattan distance function is based on absolute distances. Um, so if two objects x and y have uh, different variables, and currently we'll focus on numerical uh, numerical variables. So uh, since categorical variables, as we will see later on, are um, need some transformation before calculating distance and uh, using this type of function. So um, the uh, attributes x1, uh, x2, up to xn of object x are all numerical. Then the attributes, the same, uh, the same attribute of y is y1, um, uh, then second one, y2, and yn are numerical attributes of y. So the distance of looking at absolute values of pair of y, uh, the distance or the difference between uh, a pair of x uh, value and y value for the same attribute and for all n of them. So this is first order difference in absolute, so you can easily verify that this is um, non-negative and uh, symmetric and uh, zero. Uh, uh, it will be zero if x uh, equals to y and um, and the other relationship uh, uh, that the direct distance is uh, always shorter than the indirect dis distance between x and y. So um, now plugging this back to data, we usually Mine in data mining task, Manhattan distance, and if we are interested in two customers, um, and uh, out of this, uh, using only two uh, attributes, predictor attributes, and not to worry about which one is target. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we don't look at any target variable uh, at this point uh, in this example. So, uh, Manhattan distance will measure the distance between Su and Car. Um, but uh, based on the uh, absolute dis uh, difference between their a ages, 21 and 27, so that will be 6. And, um, and the uh, difference between um, their uh, spendings, 2300 and 2600. So the distance between two of them is 306. You can apply this to others and to see uh, who has the largest distance and who has a short, uh, uh, which two customers have the sh uh, largest distance, therefore most dissimilar, and who have the shortest distance, and therefore they are most similar. The other is Euclidean, and uh, which essentially is the square root of um, the uh, uh, of the um, the attribute values of uh, object x and object y. So um, you know, square root uh, over the sum of the square of uh, pairwise di um, dis uh, distance or pairwise differences uh, uh, for uh, the same attribute 
between values from x and value from y. So attribute x1 value um, and attribute y1 values for the same attribute, for example, h. This is the same attribute, uh, but from x, for example, spending, and this is uh, y from uh, another uh, customer, and uh, it's also spending, and take the uh, square, and sum those up and take another square root. And it can be um, different order, but typically we just have h equals to 2, uh, take a square root. Okay, so uh, similar example, uh, Sue and Carl. So the, uh, a square of uh, the difference in age, in their um, difference in their age is 6 square. And the difference uh, square of the difference in their spending is um, 300 square. Then you take a square root of this uh, total value, it will become 300 dot, um, probably um, 0, 06 or so, just round up to 301. There is something you can uh, e easily observe using Euclidean distance here is that um, out of this two, uh, 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 discrepancies amongst attributes of Su and Carl, uh, spending difference uh, dominate the distance fun uh, value. So 300 and 301 here. So this could be an issue that no matter what difference age uh, uh, the two customers have in their ages, um, it really would uh, never affect the Euclidean distance uh, significantly unless uh, there's no difference at all in their spendings. So um, let me quickly talk about um, that's, uh, how uh, data scientists or um, some functions out there uh, will need to transform other types of uh, non-numeric uh, variables. For example, we oftentimes have attributes um, that are categorical with two values, such as Mary's, uh, for example. Just if we only want to know Mary or not, uh, gender types, only two types, uh, home, internet, yes or no, then these are all binary. There are also other categorical variables that have more than two uh, levels, um, and these levels sometimes have uh, ordinal relationships. So we also call this uh, ordinal uh, variables and the levels could actually be numbers uh, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, they can be treated like numerical, but if you want to keep them integer, then this also is nominal ordinal variables. Uh, 50 states in the United States or other geographical locations, um, this have a lot more uh, values and sometimes there's also some sort of order or some, uh, some sort of uh, meaning. And so there can be lots of ways to do transformation. The ones that we are most uh, familiar with is that we kind of learn from, we learn from regression models without directly doing transformation, but we witness and observe in the regression model summary that categorical variables has been transformed into dummy variables to indicate whether uh, a dummy variable is equal to a particular categorical value, such as gender, such as, um, uh, region, north, east, north, west, or not, uh, and um, so on, so forth. So, sorry. And um, so that's one. Um, there is also um, a, a way to directly um, decide on, um, uh, measure the distance uh, as zero and one. Zero mean, essentially means no distance. Um, no distance, meaning the same, such as the same state, same gender, same marital status, same home internet, this uh, type. Uh, now then, so this should all be zeros, but if no matter which two states, as long as they're different, it's the distance is one, and different gender, different status, different home locations, or uh, home uh, state, uh, uh, home uh, city, and so uh, home type, and so on. This is also another way has been considered, and it could be uh, useful if you need to customize your own uh, distance function to consider this. Um, some can be just uh, transformed to some numerical values which represent the ranks, such as high is 3, median is 2, low is 1. 
And like I said, that some method will uh, automatically do these transformations. And um, for that reason, uh, uh, I have chosen a KNN implementation that will do that for you. So uh, you won't spend half of your code doing transformations. And so um, this is just an example of by considering other categorical variables, income, state, and gender, and based on for this Su and Carl, if we look at their uh, income at the same levels, uh, different states, and uh, different gender types, uh, using the second uh, method, we can measure their distances based on these three diff uh, variables as zero, one, and one. So the Manhattan distance value now become uh, sorry, it should be uh, 300, uh, uh, 308, not 3108. And the Euclidean distance should be, um, um, the Euclidean distance should be 301. So um, I think the problem um, I ask here, uh, ask you to identify is, uh, whether uh, it is okay for the spending distance uh, differences between Su and Carl to dominate their um, distance value based on either Manhattan or Euclidean. And uh, that depends on your applications. Oftentimes it is not. So this brings up the need for uh, numerical and transformed uh, categorical value um, Trans, uh, normalization, standardization. So any once all the variable values become numeric, then their ranges are different, then we can uh, do normalization, which is normally considered min max. This is called min max um, type, uh, normalization, is to find, uh, set the minimum and maximum um, distance for any attribute to be the same. For example, the minimum distance is zero and the maximum distance for any attributes can only be, uh, can only be as high as 100. And, uh, and preferably uh, all at 100. So for example, ages assume distance typically is up to 100. Or we can just normalize it to 100. Spending, um, we will normalize the distance, the max to um, 100 um, by uh, taking the maximum dis uh, difference and um, divide it uh, uh, by itself and multiply it by 100, like this, 100. Uh, and then the maximum distance between spendings, sorry, is 7,200. This is the maximum spending uh, difference. We normalize it to 100 by uh, doing this way. So uh, 300 over, uh, I think, 4,700 um, multiplied by 100. That will give you the distance in spending normalized. And uh, 0 is still 0. And uh, originally, the dis difference between, um, between Su and Carl in their states, state of residence, is 1, and now it becomes 100. Uh, gender is also 100. The other uh, way uh, that is very, very commonly used, um, and you can see some example of this, both of this uh, type of applications in Chapter 3 of Machine Learning with R, is called Z-score standardization using this. Uh, formulation. And um, this is a, a good understanding and good appreciation for what it takes to do k nearest neighbor or measuring distance correctly, either for uh, supervised learning or later on uh, for clustering. However, um, for you to get to um, better understand the uh, performance outcomes and the use of uh, performance outcome of uh, k-nearest neighbors uh, method, um, I chose a method that would, uh, that would do this automatically for you. So you don't have to do um, categorical variable transformation. You don't have to do normalization, standardization. And uh, difference in spendings, a large value won't 
become an issue in dominating the distance. There are lots of other distance functions, which I also won't um, get into. Um, as you continue to use um, similarity in various applications, such as recommenders, uh, soon later on in clustering, um, and text mining, and so on and so forth. More and more distance functions may make more sense for others. So I won't talk about this in uh, Jacquard distance and other cosine distance and uh, other distance functions you can find from either data science from a force business text, machine learning with R, or other references. So now we get to nearest neighbors for uh, <clears throat> predictive uh, modeling. So uh, the process, um, I summarized the process of doing uh, supervised learning using nearest neighbors uh, in these uh, steps, and they're actually pretty straightforward. First, uh, just to reinforce that when we talk uh, by nearest neighbors, or AM, uh, we mean that uh, these are the most similar instances in the data set. And later on, we will be more specific. Uh, we are actually talking about the most similar instances to um, a testing or a new instance. Um, and uh, this, um, the similar instances are identified from training. So uh, here we go. Um, so the focus is to make prediction for data in the testing set or a new instance that we may not know. Eventually, when we apply it, we have a new instance. We don't have the label, and we want to predict the label. And um, so for every instance in a testing set, um, the similarity of a testing instance to er all every uh, instance in the training set will be calculated. And you will do that, and if you have multiple records in the testing set, and if you're given that, and you can essentially calculate similarity between one training data or one training instance and one testing instance, and for every possible pair. Uh, this can be done uh, all together and store it, and so that's also one of the reasons there is some uh, good amount of memory requirement as a result of the, uh, this um, the approach that it takes. Okay, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so now, once so this part is uh, applying the distance function to calculate similarity, and um, then to start making prediction. Now we will focus on one in, uh, uh, testing instance or one new instance at a time. So now we want to predict the target variable. Uh, either it is a categorical um, variable or a, a numerical variable in the case of uh, regression, uh, classification of regression. Okay. So given this testing instance, now uh, we'll go back to the similarities that were previously generated. We search through the similarities that correspond to uh, sim similarities between this testing instance and the training instances. The purpose is to find nearest neighbors. Now, uh, using k, uh, meaning k and n works when a k is specified. So assume k is the specified, like either 3 or 10 or 30 is being given, then we will find 3 or 10 or 30 nearest neighbors in the training set. Once those k nearest neighbors are found, then the rest of the task uh, is as simple as estimating uh, the target variable value of this testing instance based on the k nearest neighbors uh, on uh, known target values. These are supervised learning, so uh, training data and testing data uh, have uh, labels provided, so their target variable values are given. The difference will be, um, there's a some difference um, between how you estimate this target variable value um, based on whether you're estimating a categorical value or estimating uh, a numerical value. Okay, so we're using example first talk about how to estimate categorical value. 
So, um, so this is an example from data science for business chapter six and table 6.1. Um, so this is the training data, John, Rachel, Ruth, Jefferson, Nora, and uh, these are the attributes, age, income, uh, in uh, thousands, and uh, how many credit cards, and whether uh, someone will respond to something, either like um, another uh, credit card uh, promotion offer or some other uh, you know, uh, you know, CD, uh, you know, uh, uh, certified deposit um, uh, type of banking offer. Um, so now the focus is uh, the new instance is David. You can assume this could be a new instance. So you, uh, David's age is 37, income is 52 cars already. And uh, either assume that this, uh, be because this is a new instance, we don't know David's response. Or we can assume David is a testing instance, we're just hiding the response. And um, because we want to estimate it and then do evaluation. So the distance uh, between David and each of the five training customers or five customers in training set will be calculated using Euclidean distance functions based on age, income, and cars attributes. So be sure that um, only use predictors and not target variables in the distance functions. Um, this one has not done normalization at this point, and you know this is a good point to show that, um, and to make some point about this, you can see that uh, you know there are some good white uh, age uh, differences, such as St. Jefferson are two older customers. And their incomes, um, their income levels, 200,000, 170,000 are also significantly higher than others. But the gaps or the difference uh, is larger in income than in age. So as a result, you can see from distance functions that uh, the distance also between, between David and these five customers uh, is also dominated by income. So uh, David's distance to Ruth and distance to Jefferson are above 100. And uh, to other three, uh, partly because their age, but mostly because their similarity, uh, their, uh, similarity in income level, um, they're all around, uh, they're all 15 or um, uh, less than 16, between 15 and 16. So, if we look at, um, uh, if we assume k equals to phi, then all these phi will be uh, nearest neighbors. If we assume k equals to three, then only John, Rachel, and Noah uh, will be the um, k nearest neighbor. So let's look at the case of O phi. Like if, all, if there are other customers, but these are actually the five nearest um, uh, five customers with the shortest distance values. Then to estimate David's response, we will look at five uh, nearest neighbors' responses. Uh, the majority class of these five similar customers is no. So uh, the most common way of estimating uh, uh, categorical a target variable of a new instance this way is to take the majority class. So David's response will be estimated to be no. However, if we assume k equals to three, then Ruth and Jefferson drop out. Out of uh, John, Rachel, and Nora are the only uh, other three near, uh, nearest neighbors. The majority class now swing switch to yes, two out of three. So David's uh, response should be estimated to yes. So you can see that the, the difference in choosing k could make a difference in um, 
the SMA for a response. Uh, 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 the SMA for a target variable. Okay. So to go back to uh, for other tasks, which we will also try, um, but we won't go through the detail uh, how to estimate the numerical uh, a numerical target variable in regression models. And it's very similar. Um, out of k nearest neighbor, instead of using majority class, we can use mean or median or some of the functions. These two are the most common ones. And similarly, uh, for classification, um, you can also, if you're interested in the probability that uh, a David belong to a yes class or belong to a no class, and can uh, basically calculate the portion of the k nearest neighbor that has the majority class, which is actually, um, if k equals to 5, then it's 0 0.6. That's an example. Okay. So um, it's very, um, one of the reasons I feel it is very valuable for um, the class to know KNN, um, besides that KNN's um, that similarity has been a foundation for many other uh, task and KNN is one of the most um, uh, popular um, method that uses similarity. It's also, it has some uh, different, uh, very unique characteristics compared to uh, other supervised learning algorithms we have learned, decision tree, naive Bayesian, other black box methods, um, as well as uh, regression. So um, the Difference really has been related to the answer to this question. Does the training data train a model in K uh, no, in this method or using this algorithm? So let's let's think about that. Uh, let's um, that uh, by going through, walking through what happened during the training phase. When you have a training data set, and uh, the the use of the training data by this KNN method is to um, find the similar customers or similar instances to a testing uh, instance or to a new instance. So before you actually have the te a testing instance or a testing data set, uh, there's no similarity to be calculated. So during training phase, uh, the algorithm basically will import, uh, import the data and uh, you know and uh, uh, and in its own internal data structure and store the training data so we call this internal data structure in memory and uh, this term is used to categorize this uh, often to categorize this uh, KNN algorithm because the need to store training data in memory and um, and that's it. Then you go on to prediction phase. So as a result, the answer is here. We actually don't do anything other than import and store because there's nothing you can do, not even to calculate similarities or distance functions. So um, as a result, it is pretty fast, but memory intensive because it depends on how large your training data is. Um, so. The work is, most of the work is here, which we went through on slide 16 already, where you, now that once you get into prediction phase for your testing, giving a testing data set or a for um, giving a whole data set and you want to do cross validation. And then now it will start to calculate similarity, find k nearest neighbor, do, uh, uh, do voting um, uh, to estimate the target variable for every testing instance. And we saw the process on slide 16. We you know, went through it, uh, talk about it uh, in using an example in slide 17. So this is the main work. And it's a lot of work to go through the whole training data set, either that, either that being 10,000 records, 20,000 records, or, um, you know, or uh, a small amount and for every testing data set. So the work Main work is here and could be time consuming here. And um, so as a result, this unique characteristic to summarize, it really doesn't build a model, but although we will still call this training phase, 
similar to others, but the training here has some what different meaning. Uh, unless uh, we also want to do something else during training, which we will talk about later on. So the common categorization is, this is a, a instance-based. So the prediction happened for when an instance uh, uh, label or target variable value needs to be estimated. So it's an instance-based learning algorithm. And, uh, and instance-based IB um, is uh, an IBL, IBL instance-based learning is uh, one of the popular uh, KNN methods out there. So oftentimes this type of algorithm out there are called KNN, the, the, the actual names are called KNN, or sometimes uh, IBL. And uh, because training data is stored in memory, so it's also called memory-based learning algorithms. And um, also because during training, there's, uh, the algorithm, this supervised learning algorithm in a way is lazy. It's just not when others are very busy building a model, uh, like this is in tree, like naive patient, like support vector machine, or neural network. Uh, this one does not do anything. So it's called lazy learners to also. Very interesting name. So uh, now I want to talk about K. So, uh, to talk about K um, is also related to um, which K will give you good performance. And related to performance, we also want to see whether the performance is general to different data sets that uh, this model may be applied to uh, or this method can be applied to. So we'll talk about um, uh, the geometric visualization of the um, uh, the training space, and also to see um, from that visualization that how KN model can potentially be um, be overfitted to training data, and this is especially the extreme case is definitely when K equals to one, which means that you are predicting um, an instance um, target uh, variable value only based on one nearest neighbor. And um, so this is um, a, a figure and from uh, Data Science for Business uh, by Provost and Fawcett. And there are also a lot of other similar diagrams, for example, from uh, Machine Learning with R Chapter 3. Um, this is an example of uh, using colors, uh, or shades, or gray, and also uh, uh, shapes of um, uh, the points or of the instance, such as uh, squares, uh, stars, and triangles. So three shades of gray uh, correspond white for rectangles and uh, dark gray for triangle um, instances, and stars and uh, middle gray, shade of gray is uh, are the other class. And so these are uh, data for uh, supervised learning for three classes. So when you do uh, KNN, when K equals to one, or we say one NNN, single um, nearest neighbor, and this is the training data, the way to use one nearest neighbor to estimate the target variable, uh, to estimate um, uh, this training instance uh, uh, class, it will actually be using itself to tra uh, train it. So this is uh, because we're visualizing the training space. And um, so you'll find um, every single one of them will get their own class uh, labels uh, as the estimated class, so it's a perfect classifier for this training data set. And uh, the separations amongst different classes um, using k equals to 1 is all just around uh, groups of them or a single ones of them. So it's very jagged, and it can be nested, can be embedded. It's not like lines. Um, or planes in KVM, uh, K, uh, in SVM, 
or um, you know, segmented uh, space using um, uh, using the values of attributes. And uh, this is really a very extreme case. Uh, you can see from this there could be very uh, uh, all kinds of concerns related to overfitting. So it could potentially overfit a lot because uh, it will always uh, try to uh, you know since identify only one nearest neighbor and will select itself as its own nearest neighbor. And uh, in training data, it works very well. It could potentially also work well when you apply uh, one and n a classifier that's to testing data. So one n has worked, and sometimes uh, one n may be uh, selected, or k equals to one may be selected. Um, as you increase k, for example, in another figure uh, using k equals to three, then you can see that um, the boundaries amongst different classes, and it's not so the now the the colors are what is being predicted, and the shapes are the actual uh, class. So you can see in the pre uh, the prediction for rectangle uh, a square class, there is one uh, or potentially two errors. And uh, in this, using k equals to 30, and um, in this area, um, for the stars that uh, these stars are correctly uh, predicted to be stars, but there are some uh, 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 triangles, sorry, uh, that are predicted to be stars. And similarly, in this area, triangles are predicted to be triangles, but stars also get predicted to be uh, triangles. So just from this, uh, you can see the uh, prediction uh, errors are higher, but the potential for this to be general to other data sets, uh, given these boundaries, uh, are higher. Because it's really not cut around. The boundaries are not cut around just the labels. So that in the future, once the points move a little bit, then immediately the error rates uh, shut up or increases. So this is a good way to vi visualize that the differences in K, that as you increase, the performance may not necessarily improve, but it could be more generalizable or it can be more general. And so that's the point. The boundaries get smoother, and uh, which is good for possible uh, higher gen uh, generality, um, but it doesn't guarantee improved performance. So as a result, then um, it's really important for data scientists to uh, search for a, a good K. Uh, there are some common practices that you can uh, apply to choose um, a design on K. Um, and some machine learning uh, researchers have proposed uh, some uh, using k equals square root of the size of the data set, either testing or training, or whole data set. And I've been using mostly suggesting some k uh, related to the size of the uh, training set. And, um, and the other one is um, the chapter 3 in Machine Learning with R also have uh, advocated, uh, and most data scientists who have over, uh, advocated is uh, you really should set k to different values and make a comparison and based on how accurate predictions are and uh, whether uh, but whether uh, without having uh, too much of an overfitting issue or um, that the high uh, a good performance can still be gener uh, general to uh, various testing sets so um, this we all this we definitely can try. The other one is um, if uh, there's some uh, implementation already done, or if you would like, uh, systematically evaluate every possible k. You don't do this to the infinite, but uh, give a reasonable maximum k, and then start to evaluate from k equals to one, uh, which means one nearest neighbor to two to three, and then up to the maximum value, and then select the best k. And uh, some method has provided this option. So for example, the 
KAN implementation in our work called IB uh, instance based learning, um, but instead of L is K to stand for different uh, K that you can choose, uh, allow this option. And so uh, I'll just briefly talk about this. Um, and um, when you assign, so when you uh, set, choose the feature or the set the parameter setting to automatically select K, then K um, that, that is usually given in a KNN function is uh, uh, recognized as the maximum value as opposed to a fixed value. So let's try a varying uh, a variable called KK that we can change from one equals to um, uh, all the way up to this maximum k. For every uh, kk, um, then essentially you want to evaluate the prediction performance of a training set because uh, a function like ibk that we use and we can choose this uh, k, uh, sorry, x equals to true to be the setting to trigger automatic selection of k. So that k equals to 40, 40 is the assumed maximum value of kk. And um, similar to other parameters, uh, we change for other algorithms. We change them using worker control and in a con uh, and in the function, for example, uh, I, uh, in function ibk. And um, when you specify this, this is only sort of the training phase, not really training a model, but this is the phase. Um, when IP, IPK function is called, it's not a testing phase. So there's no testing data given there yet. So this K will be selected using training data. And how do you evaluate the performance of um, different K? Then uh, this is done by assuming our training data is test data, one instance at a time, and the whole training data set is still the training data set, but pull one instance out. So this is actually essentially um, similar to what is called leave one out. This is the same as what is called leave one out cross validation. And um, uh, which I will just briefly uh, mention, this is a, an old uh, a slide from uh, we use. Uh, it's also from data science for business talk about 5-4 cross-validation. But without changing this diagram, I just want to talk about this is cross-validation. Leave one out validation or leave one out cross-validation. Essentially, it's an extreme case, the most extreme case of cross-validation, which is the case which happens when you uh, cut each record in the whole data set into a fold. So if the whole data set has n records, like n equals to uh, 20,000, and um, then the number of folds in this leave one out cross-validation is actually 20,000 fold cross-validation, where each fold only has one record. So you will use all the rest folds to train them or to uh, not train, but to uh, in, in KNN to be used to predict uh, this. And then, um, uh, and uh, which is only one instance. And, and we talk about because uh, this is uh, all the training data uh, in this case is actually the whole data set. So sometimes the, uh, the neighbor, uh, the, the instance itself, will also be identified from this training um, as its nearest neighbor. So uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's uh, similar to, because the training data set is actually the whole data set. So to go back and complete this is, um, as you finish through for each uh, iterations when k equals it, when you increase k from star from one and then increase by one to two and so on, then you will do leave one out for every instance and then evaluate the performance and you can calculate like average accuracy or um, 
average uh, 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 MAE or predicted errors, and then to uh, for each k kk. And so, for example, if kk equals to one, I should give you the highest accuracy or um, the best average MAE. You may set uh, using this automatic selection. Uh, you may say kk equals to one. Or you may find kk equals to 30 um, compared to all the other uh, possible kk will give you the best um, uh, classification accuracy, right? Or the best other predictive error uh, or like MAE or RMSE and for prediction errors, then you will select that kk. So this is uh, an option that you can consider. And um, it will be interesting to see when um, a model, um, uh, whether kk equals to uh, 1, or um, oftentimes gets uh, selected by this automatic selection of k for the data set. And uh, one thing that I want to remind you is that uh, IBK, uh, when you use this uh, option to automatically select k, very time consuming. Um, so for our regression um, data sets, um, they're smaller, so this will go fairly uh, relatively fast. But for classification data sets like income, like churn, like um, churn uh, minority, they're all uh, you know, over 10,000 or some 20,000 or over 30,000. So um, you can sample down or you can uh, for your own testing, but for assignment, uh, give yourself some time. Um, you know, you may walk away and come back to it. Okay, the last uh, factor that I um, uh, is will be good for KN data scientists to try is um, whether to treat every single one of the K nearest neighbors the same when you use their labels, when the method uses their target variable values to estimate um, the uh, class label or the numerical target variable value um, for a testing instance. And the answer is, uh, yeah, you can change it. Because some people will say, um, for example, using this case, where it's from previous um, example, um, you know, uh, the five training data uh, to David, their distance uh, is uh, if my k equals to five. And so I'm looking at all five as the nearest neighbors. But then the way uh, the label got um, skewed by the estimation got skewed by these two nodes and tipped the scale um, you know, to, uh, with one more node, then the estimated label of class is no for David. So David is the testing instance or the new instance. However, um, this can be adjusted or to be more fair if we say, hey, actually, even though k equals to five, Jeff and Ruth are not as close as the three. So let's adjust their weight based on the, uh, their distance to David. Okay, so the weight of them to David are adjusted. You can see this higher distance and lower weight. And shorter distance, uh, higher weight, very similar. And you can do um, different functions to, to derive this. And this, uh, the most important thing is that they uh, come up, uh, you know, uh, uh, also translate to an amount that will be used to um, uh, calculate the, the estimated numerical value or the class. So, um, so for example, uh, we use uh, this to come up with the final class probability estimate for David is 
the the probability for the yes class now based on this contribution now is 0 0.65. So this two value total together. Um, but for no, even though there are three labels or three customers, but it only total up to uh, about 0 0.35. So the higher class probability, very similar to naive Bayesian, will be uh, uh, will correspond to uh, the target class that you estimate. So 0 0.5 for yes class, and yes now is the predicted class instead of uh, no. Even though your k is still five, have, you haven't changed that. Okay. So uh, this type of contributions can uh, some examples are one over distance or one minus distance. Uh, these are functions that you can find in uh, KNN methods such as IBK that is used uh, from our Weka that is used in this class. So, um, so this type of method is called weighted voting or similarity moderated or distance moderated voting. So um, as I mentioned, uh, the way it works is to give more similar uh, neighbors, more weight out of the same k. And the uh, weights can be this too. And I just want to point out that in your IBK function, so this should be a, a capital B. And uh, is the same, uh, is how you can trigger the use of this. Um, voted weighting or similarity adjusted weighting and f equals to 2 is the one uh, when you uh, trigger this type of uh, weighted voting uh, approach and if you don't have either one of this then uh, you, you, you're not using any weighted voting you're just using for example majority or mean or median and so as you could already see in the example even though the, uh, how many neighbors, nearest neighbor k is still the same, but using this could possibly improve the accuracy or potentially also uh, 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 increase mo a model's uh, generality. Okay, so we're almost done just to point out a couple issues. Uh, most people would say nearest neighbor is not a really intelligent uh, method because it doesn't have a model. Um, so the lack of intelligence is mainly that you don't have the knowledge uh, that is embedded in the model where you can see how trees split, uh, you can see the conditional probabilities, and so on and so forth. Um, but this is not too different in a way from other black box methods like SVM or uh, neural network that you cannot quite explain um, the results or you don't have a model. And the fact that um, now more and more people find that making recommendations, for example, based on uh, what other similar customers like, uh, could be um, actually very useful. Um, so that hasn't stopped KNN from being adopted. Uh, the other one is uh, time complexity and dimensionality issue. Uh, uh, because distance functions are all based on attribute calculations, not like decision tree, it may uh, deprioritize or prune out some attributes that don't have a predictive power. But this, uh, this approach, even if you have an attribute that is very noisy there, it will still be used. So be very careful with what you select. And also, uh, you could possibly think about using domain knowledge to do feature selection and also adjust your similarity and distance function. And lastly, um, as we already mentioned, that this can be computationally very time consuming. Um, so uh, besides when you try to automatically s find the optimal k, but also when you uh, do cross-validation and so on and so forth. So in your assignment six, you will you will be asked to do three, four cross-validation for data sets size, um, data sets as big as 20,000 um, records. So again, give yourself some time, uh, in, you know, uh, let it run. So don't wait until the last minute to uh, test it, need the file before you submit the uh, results. 
so this I have already talked about that in um, based on my experience last semester, I feel that uh, I do not in this semester I do not want uh, the class to uh, spend time right now uh, writing code to normalize attributes and also um, and to learn the difference between using the functions in chapter 3 called KAN from the class package, uh, which is different. Um, and uh, also KAN there um, has not been fully tested for numerical value prediction. We kind of tried to find other and we found something that worked, and, um, but it's also a lot of explanation for the class. So as a result, starting from this semester, I'm uh, not using this to uh, save some time. Uh, moreover, in the future, I would uh, encourage you to learn more about normalization. If uh, there, uh, for some clustering um, packet uh, function, for example, the one that is used in this uh, k-means in this uh, book, uh, it also requires normalization, um, but there are others that don't. So. Um, but learning more about normalization and z-score standardization is always good for data scientists, um, given our short time, um, our time pressure, so we will not. Instead, I use our weka. As a result, you don't have to normalize, and you find that um, even though it is a lazy learner, you still have somewhat of a similar um, function structures or code structure using IBK and then do uh, evaluate what kind of classifier. And in fact, in assignment six, I extensively asked you to use evaluate what kind of classifier to shorten the amount of code that is required to get uh, cross validation uh, results and so on and so forth. Uh, it's really, uh, in my opinion, easier to use. You can, it can be used for classification and regression. You also have automatic case selection uh, and also allows for weighty voting. So those you will try uh, uh, in this uh, assignment six. And I hope you uh, enjoy it um, more. And assignment six is actually has very similar uh, data. I mean, use exactly same data sets as assignment uh, five and uh, the focus, except that the focus is on IBK, not on uh, multi-layer perceptron or not on KSVM. And uh, you learn how to apply them and think about the issues with KN and and try some of this parameter adjusting. Okay, that's all. Thank you.